ብዙ አባታችን ብዙ አባታት ወፍሎስ ዶክተር የሀገር ሰራተኞች ከፓፓስ ዶክተር አባታችን መላከ ሰባ ቆሞስ አባ ኃይለ ኢየሱስ የሀገር ሰራተኞች ዋና ስራ አስኪያጅና የደብራችን ዋና አስተዳዳሪ ዶክተር አባታችን ጋር ሚስተር ቆሞስ አባ ቴዎድሮስ የ አስተጋ ሰራዳ የተከናን ተካናና የአማራ ወቅት ሲጋር ብረት በቅዱስ ሚካኤል ክርስቲያን ዋና አስተዳዳሪ ተጋራ ይካው ተበደ ክርስቲያን አባቶቻችን ዛሬ እጅግ በዛሬ ነው ስለመጡ ያንዳንዳቸው ስም እየተጠቀመ አስተያየት ነው ሻማት ይሆናል ተጋራ አባታችን አባ ጌዮናርዶስ እና ኔታ ግሩማንዶ ይከተተው ዘክሌ ኢራቅ የማጋራ የማኖት አባ ሰለሞን የደብራችን ነው ከሃናት መላከት ሲሆን ኮሞስ አባ ዳንኤል ይሁን ከሃናት ከሲስተ ስፋይ ይቁ መምህር የታ ጸሃይ ይገብራችን ዛሬ በሊቃው ተበተክስያን ደምቃ ነሽቹ ይሄን ያደረጋ መላከታችን ዲያሎግ ክብርና መስቀያና ለስም አጣራሪ ይሁን ሲጋርና መስቀያው Good, good news, the word of God coming through our ears, 
Let's pray that it touches our hearts. I invite you can hand over to the stage. Thank you. May God have you here in the word of life. As honorable life. So, this is what I've got at you. May God's name be blessed from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun. Uh, our proto deacon, our art deacon Samuel, already greeted you all in English, so I'll leave it at that. But during the holiday of the Archangel Michael, there are a lot of things that take place, but I think it's very important because some people even say that angels take names, that we begin with his name. So it will begin a little bit more interactive and then the rest will be from me. I want to start from some of you because, by the way, I've seen you participating in the worship of this Waisema so far. I expect that some of you already have some knowledge of the church. By any chance, can anyone raise their hand and tell me what Mikhail's name means. Now, I hear silence. This is not a rhetorical question. The hint I'll give you is the answer is a rhetorical question. Yes? Uh, was it like, like God or something? Very good. Very good. Very good. I'm going to add one word for you. You said like God. I'm going to add one word, which is who is like God, which makes it into a question. Manu kama Who is like God? And it's very important because when we think of the Archangel St. Michael, from the beginning, just when we think about his name, we don't even reflect until where we find him in scripture and in all of the beautiful hymns and spiritual songs of the church that we just heard, we learn that even in his whole identity, he points to a question. The reason it's a rhetorical question is because everybody knows the answer. The answer to who is like God is what? A little louder. No one. A little louder. No one. No one. Thank you. And that means the answer is so obvious, he doesn't need to say it. His name just is the question. The question that no one, that is answered by no one. No one is like God. No one is comparable to God. In everything he does, keep this in mind. When we get to the actual biblical text I'm going to read you, you're going to learn. It's very funny sometimes when parents, or it can even be older cousins, nephews, whatever it is, some family members say, Oh, you're so cute. You're a cute little boy. You're a cute little girl. You look like an angel. And the reason why I think it's so funny is because you have to be careful. Because not all angels are the same. There are Malak Abraham and Malak Asimah. There are angels of light and angels of darkness. So if anyone ever tells you you look like an angel, you say, which one are you talking about? <laughs> and it better be the angel of light. It better be the angel of light that you're talking about. He has other titles though too. Even in the Hebrew it sounds very much like this. He's called Malach Yahweh or Malach Adonai, which means the angel of the Lord. Malach Yahweh, when we exactly the Malach. So the angel of the Lord. Sometimes his name is not explicitly written in the Bible, but in a bunch of places, especially in the Old Testament, you see that it's written Malach Yahweh or the angel of the Lord. And there are many, 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 many angels. But when we talk about the or the angel of the Lord, we're talking about Saint Michael, who is archangel even amongst the archangels. And you take it further, he has another name. That one you can find especially in Exodus and, other, and in many other places. I'll show you one a little bit later on. But he has another name as well. And he's called the commander of the hosts. In other words, the general, some people say the captain, some people say the prince, some people will even say the chief of the army of Yahweh, of the army of the Lord. And that's a pretty scary title, because every time the army or the hosts of the Lord are mentioned in Scripture, you better watch out. It means judgment is around the corner. And judgment 
is one of the most important functions that God serves us. And people, even in this day, try to intellectualize away or try to wish away. But one thing the Orthodox Church stands firm on is that God is a judge. He has many jobs. He has many faces, He loves you, He blesses you, He keeps you, He preserves you, He sustains you, He brings you to this very moment so that we can worship Him. Just like He brought the Israelites out of the desert, uh, being guided by day and by night, as we were saying in the hymns earlier, by Nikai. And He fed them manna or manna from the desert, which itself means what is it? Food from the sky, when normally people expect to toil and have their own food come from the ground by their labor. That's back in the day, now you just go to the supermarket and make it on your own. Although maybe some of you are making jada at home, I'm not sure. So, he is, as God is the Lord of hosts, God is exactly the Sabaoth, which is the Lord of hosts. And that word Sabaoth, by the way, same in Hebrew and it is. Mikael is the general, the chief, the prince, you can say the aristocratic, military leader underneath God, serving in his army, much like in our Ethiopian history, the Masafim served in these ways under the Negus that were around, or the kings that were around in that time. So let me read from you. My first reading will be from Jude, which is often read by the second deacon during the Kabbalah of the holiday. So I'll read Jude. There's only one chapter, so I'm not going to say the chapter. And it will be verses 5 to 11. But I am determined to remind you, although you once knew all this, that Jesus, having saved the people from the land of Egypt, secondly destroyed those who were faithless. And angels, who did not maintain their own position of rule, but instead deserted their proper habitation, he has kept in everlasting chains under never gloom for the judgment of the great day. Just as in the same manner as these, Sodom and Nagamora and the cities thereabout, who hoard about and went in pursuit of other flesh, provide an example by undergoing the just record of fire from the age. Yet in the same way, these dreamers defile flesh and treat lordship with contempt and defame the glories or the glorious ones. Yet when the archangel Michael contended with the slanderer, or the devil, arguing over the body of Moses, he did not dare to bring a defamatory condemnation against him, but instead said, May the Lord rebuke you, may the Lord admonish you. But as for these men, on the one hand, they defame whatever things they have not received. And on the other, whatever things they do understand in a natural way, like unreasoning animals, by these they are corrupted. Alas for them, for they have the error of Balaam. Uh, oh, excuse me, for they have traveled the path of Cain, and for profit have abandoned themselves to the error of Balaam, and have perished in the sedition or in the rebellion of Korah. The very first thing I'm going to show you is if you look at that I didn't plan this, I had forgotten I've been here a few times. It says right there above the Bismillahi Ahazikurru. Ahazikurru is a very interesting phrase that we have in Gittis. It's unique. If you ever go to an Egyptian church, they use a different word. They use the word Pantokrator, which is from Greek. And it means he who has all the power. Maybe you heard the words in English, almighty or omnipotent. It means he who can do anything he wants. Even if some philosophers try to ask silly questions that distract you. Like could he make a chair or a stone that he himself couldn't lift? It's not relevant because that action has no salvific effect. There's no point to it. But the point is he can do whatever he wants to do. And whatever he does is good and right and just and neat. And he has all the might. So this is how we speak in English and in Greek and in Coptic. But what did our Gittis fathers say? Our Gittis fathers said, Ahaze Kuru, which reminds you of this American song maybe you heard as a kid. They sing this as when you're a kid. He's got the whole wide world in what? A little louder? A little louder? He's 
got the whole wide world in his hands. That's what Ahaziz Hugo means. It means everything is in his hand. The whole universe, the whole world, the whole cosmos, the heavens and the earth and the fullness thereof are in his hands. He controls everything. And the first point that you have to remember, because he's a god of totality, a god of universality, is that he has salvation and damnation. He has deliverance and destruction. He has rescue and the ability to wipe you out. He's functional just like the fundamental elements of the world. You can have wind that on a hot day comes and gives you a nice cool breeze that cools you down. And that same wind, if you're in the Wizard of Oz or in Tornado Alley somewhere in the Midwest or in the South, can come as an one of us, destroy your house and take you away from where you belong. So he has both of those powers to, like a hand, give you a nice massage, the best massage you've ever had in your life, or, like a boxer, give you the best punch that knocks you out that you've ever had in your life. He's got both of those, salvation and destruction in his hand. And here, for those angels of light, obviously, and those of us humans who are like them, salvation is offered. But for those angels of darkness, and for people who follow along them, and will get to them, like false teachers and false students, they will receive destruction from his hand. It talks here about disobedient angels. In the monastic tradition of Ethiopia, there's a great concept that maybe our monks could tell you more about, called Asu Obaat, which means you need to stay in your entrance. You need to endure living in your monastic cell. And you need to live there and not go and wander too much. Because if you wander too much, you might fall into sin. The angels, although they're not monks, and they might be monk-like in some ways, they have their own monastic cell, their own habitation, their own domicile, their own place and things that they're supposed to do at the command of God. But here, you have some unruly, disobedient angels who broke us from Allah. And they left where they came from. And they are judged by God, put into everlasting chains until that great day. And that great day will be judgment day. Even the author of this New Testament translation that I read from you, I think he writes the most beautiful English ever. He's a baptized Orthodox Christian. His name is DDH or Day Dependent Heart. But one of the ideas he's been trying to popularize is that there is no judgment. And in these last days before judgment, you may hear false teachers. If anyone ever tells you there's no judgment, they're a liar, they're a false teacher, and they've gone against the word of God as it is written for us. These fallen ones are a misali or a mashal, as I said, for false teachers. So how do you know whether or not someone is a false teacher? Here, they give me a nice, clean, three ways that you can check. Because you know a tree by its fruit. Number one, it says they defile flesh. Less specifics for those of you who are younger, but those of you who are older may understand what it means. It's referring to sexual immorality, even amongst angels, but now also referring to false teachers who go their way. The second thing that it says is how can they end up there in the first place? It's because they've rejected the authority of God, who is above them, who commanded them otherwise than doing these things. And um, the false teachers are different because they're not angels, but the false teachers who are like these fallen ones, their issue is going to be not having a good relationship with their local bishop. And so this is a great, a great test that you can have. For anyone who says that they're, they're a great Christian teacher, says, do you know your bishop? Does your bishop know you? It's a very great question. Uh, I'm sure I would like to appreciate that question, but, but this is very important because St. Ignatius of Antioch says, where there is the bishop, there is the church. No bishop, no church. 
<laughs> if you don't have a bishop, you have a different enterprise. You have some other uh, denomination or branch, but not the Orthodox Church. The final thing, the third thing it says that you can test false teachers by is whether or not they are defaming the glories or the glorious ones who are the Kapusan of the Light, the holy angels, and other heavenly beings like uh, the 24 priests of heaven, whose holiday was also this week, the four living creatures or the four beasts. And so they are talking smack to these dignitaries, and these are not dignitaries or glorious ones from the UN or some other government entity, but like I said, they're spirits who are obedient to God. Finally, we have Kikus Mikai directly in Malek uh, Yehuda in this letter to Jude. And I love this. It's a story that I'm going to read for you again, which is in Zechariah, the myth of Zechariah, or the prophecy of Zechariah. But he is arguing with Satan. And it's interesting because the Bible, even in the Ethiopian church that we have, it doesn't say what the whole argument is about uh, in the Old Testament. But in Jude, it mentions it, and there are other books that kind of fill in the gaps about what was going on. But both, and you'll see it in Zechariah and in Jude, you have the devil, Satan, both different names are used. Satan means the accuser, the complainant, the person in court who's suing you, um, the enemy, the adversary. These are all synonyms for what Satan means. And the devil means the slanderer, the one who ruins your name, who ruins your reputation. And he's doing that for God. So in both cases, you have an argument between St. Michael and the devil, or Satan. And in both cases, even in the worst case scenario, listen, you can fight a lot of people, but the devil or Satan is the worst one you're going to fight, right? Even in the worst case, right? You're not going to fight a human worse than him. Even in the worst case, it said he didn't just speak bad words to him. He didn't just cuss him out. He didn't say just bad things. Instead, he invoked the name of his Lord, who he's named after. And he said, as I told you, may the Lord rebuke you. May the Lord admonish you. By the way, it doesn't just mean like, shoot, scram, and get away. To rebuke and to admonish means maybe teach you. Through his teaching is how he rebukes you. It's how he admonishes you. It's how he tries to get you to change. Let's hope all this is for the devil. But the human is your encounter. If you ever feel so mad, you're going to try to cut someone out or tear them up because you feel justified, just remember that St. Michael didn't do that, even to the devil. So what excuse do you have? The answer to that is also rhetorical. No excuse at all. So, instead of insulting whoever you think is your enemy, who's not really your enemy, they're an opportunity to love a human being made in the image and likeness of God. Instead, maybe try silence. Again, this is something that the monks, especially the desert fathers, practice for years and years. Try silence. If you can't control what you're going to say, at least try silence. You want to go and you think you're even holier than just silence and you've got a lot of self-control, which is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, who says in Galatians. I got uh, an example of something you can try to do. This is my favorite thing to tell my students and very few people have ever taken me up on it. I encourage you to try to pay whoever you think your enemy is. I'm serious, pay them. Give him $20 and say, I'll give you $20 if you read me a chapter of the Bible. And see if they say yes. It's a win-win situation. They get $20, reading a chapter is not a lot, and you get a chance to love your enemy. If you show me the receipts on Venmo, Cash App, whatever you got, and you do it, we'll see how much money I have and how much I can last. I will pay you back if you do that. You got me. They have my number. Contact me, show me the receipts. I, I, I don't have unlimited money, so I can't do that forever. But if I get a few of you to do that, and you now love your enemies, I will feel like this will be a successful trip from Los Angeles to Vegas. The next thing I'll give you is homework. He mentions three things, but they're very long, and we've already been worshiping for a long time, so I don't want to hold you. We still have the pillar of Allah tomorrow. He mentions Cain from Genesis chapter 4, if you want to check out Cain. Balaam from Numbers 22. It goes on for a couple chapters, but Numbers 22, you'll see the story. And Korah's rebellion, that's not the legend of Korah, if you're out of our fans in the building, that's the biblical Korah. And that's in number 16. So, when you look at those stories, Cain is obviously the story of fratricide. 
which is brother killing brother. And worse, older brother killing younger brother. And the older brother always has responsibility over the younger brother. With Allah, it's greed, it's avarice, it's seeking money and profit over the word of the Lord. His own donkey rebukes him when you read that story. It's a very famous story. I won't say that word for donkey in English, but those of you who know, you know. And if you know Amari or Tizinia, it's it's an insult in that language too. Ahidiya or Ahdi is not a good thing to be called. Alright? Finally, we have Quarz Rebellion, where the earth itself swallows up 250 brothers, and fire is thrown down by God because they wanted to usurp the authority of Moses and Aaron. I'm giving you the footnotes, but that's your homework. Go read about Korah's rebellion, Balaam, and Cain. I'll read from Zechariah from you, and shortly we'll finish. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, saying, The Lord was angry concerning your ancestors. Oh, excuse me, I thought I was reading from chapter 1. Chapter 3, 1 to 5. And the Lord showed me the great priest Joshua standing before the presence of Malachi Zadia, of the angel of the Lord. And Satan, or the adversary, stood to his right to resist him. And the Lord said to the adversary, to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O adversary. And the Lord, the one who chose Jerusalem, rebuke you. Behold, is this not as a firebrand removed from the fire? And Joshua was clothed, clothed with filthy garments, and he stood before the face of the angel. And he answered and said to the one standing before his face, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. And he said to him, Behold, I have removed your iniquity, I have removed your transgressions, I have removed your lawlessness and clothed him with a robe, and put a clean turban on his head. And they placed a clean turban on his head, and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord, Malachi Zadia, stood nearby. It's such an important passage, and we have such a mixed crowd. I'm going to read it for you in Amarimi as well, even though it's an English passage. Uh, yeah. I want you guys to say it. Repeat after me. So, in this last section, there's always, um, in this generation, with the spirit of this age, people who like to blur lines. They like to blur lines between good and evil. Back in the day, movies, cartoons used to be a little bit more obvious. Sometimes it's nice in some moments where there's some ambiguity. But now they want everything to be great, everything to be blurred. The difference between boys and girls, men and women, blur. They like blurriness. Because in blurriness, there's no accountability. But God likes precision. God likes to give you two options. Especially when you see Medecta Yohannes or First John, you see light and darkness, good and evil, sin and righteousness. And here in this passage, you have two things. You have 
filthy garments or filthy clothes, dirty clothes, and clean clothes. Two options. Do you want dirty clothes or do you want rich robes, clean clothes? And his answer is, of course, going to be clean. He says, put a pure turban on his head. What is a nisul tintin? What is a pure turban? What is a clean turban? Is it what we wear during the Mahdi when we're praising God? No. We remember during Salat al for the prayer of faith, we say God is the God of everything. Again, remember, He's the total, the living and the dead. He is the God of all those who ever lived and all those who ever died. He's the God of the visible and the invisible. Okay? So that means not the visible cemetery, not the visible turban, not the visible filthy clothing, not the visible clean clothing that you have, but the invisible clothing of love. That's what he wants to see to you. And we learn about love, for example, in Masal Kasamri, in the book of Samuel, the phrase everybody knows, maybe you don't know where it's from, but I'm sure you heard it. Matazas, come in to me, Obedience is greater than sacrifice. And in Tibrita Hosea, or in Hosea, it says something very similar. It says that he wants mercy and not sacrifice. So, the way we perfect our love, the way we are clothed in our love, is by making sure we are practicing matazas, obedience, and nidrat, like what we receive from the angel. Mercy. So remember, through obedience and through mercy, you can resemble the angels of light, the good ones, not the fallen ones, and especially the Kamalite, the Dus Mikhail. Bahachurun Namasa Sarandun, Satakandun Tamarinya, Akbato Chishana. But today, in the Uptana Shatun Mohan, Mikrabatrut, Adaratrut, the Sengani, Dikurna Sendisa, Sanasarat Nacho. ዚያማታፈርክቻ
Deacon Henry P. Thomas, a great blessing. He, he began from the name of, of, Mikhail, of Michael to begin with. And he took us all the way to be able to understand what angels' roles are in the heavenly realm as well as here on earth. And for that, we're truly grateful. I, I, I appreciate you in accepting our invitation and coming out here and making sure that the, the youth are fed, you know. So the, our next program is going to be with our Sunday school, the Zenruns, our brothers and sisters. They have a few uh, hymns in English prepared for us, so I'll, I invite all of you guys to get your hands together and your little stuff together, and we'll sing some praises and hymns in English.
ዲያቆናት መዘምራን ምናና ምናና ወጣት ጆቻችን ቋናደረሳችሁ ባራብራደረሳችሁ <laughs> ያቆየው ያቆየው ሳምዩ ያቆየው 
ሌሎች ይያቆናል ወጣቶች ይያይ ባካቸው በጣም ደስ ሰላም ነው ግን አደረ በደም ይታስተው የዚህ ነው እንደ ታይታ እንደ ትይ እንደ ትሪታ ታይታ እና ነው መሰረት ያለው ነገር ነው አጥጥታቸው ነገር ሁሉ ግንላቸው ላይ ወጣ ቤተ ክርስቲያን ነገር ሁሉ አታስተው ቢሏቸው ማንም አይነቀንቃቸው ቢገፋ ይወጣ በደም መሰረት ያለው ትምህርት እንዴ ማውቃ ያለብናችሁ ታሪ ለሰው መታይታችሁ ቁጭ ነው እንደዚህ መዘመራችሁ ጥሩ ነው ግን ላውላ ወጦ ልቡሽ ተላ እየተሰራ ቤት መሆን የለበት በሰ በሰላት መታነጽ መቻል አለበት ያስከወረ ድረስ የክርስቲያን ተስፋ የሀገር ተስፋ ወደ ቤት አለ ወደ ቤት አለ እና እናንተ እየተቀመለ ያየው የተፈሰሰ ገና ይሁን ልጆቻችን በተፈጠሩ ወቅት ወሰጋው ሞገስ ያሳድጋችሁ ለጋር ብለሽ ነው ያን ለጋር ቢውት ነው ኦል ዘ ታይ አሜን ያ ነጥያ ብለሽ አሁን ወደ ሰማያ ታችኑ